Hi there, I'm John of John's Carnivorous Plants and this is my indoor carnivorous plant nursery. Today, I'm gonna to teach you how to grow cobra lilies, our Darlingtonia californica, a very beautiful spe species of pitcher plant that is native to California and Oregon. In this video, I'm gonna teach you everything you need to know to grow one in your own home. So please, check out the description to all the relevant sections of this video, as well as links to my social media, including my Discord, where I do live Q&As every Thursday, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so you can see what's going on in the nursery life, or just leave a message in one of the chat channels, and I'll try to get back to you. Usually check it about twice a day. I also have a link in the description to my nursery, where you can buy one of these beautiful plants for me directly, though I don't think I offer uh, darling Tonya right now and in the future it's probably going to be spotty as you see later on in this video <laughs> I hope you enjoy this video please like and subscribe and thank you so much for watching The first and most important point to cultivating any carnivorous plant is climate. You need to provide a stable climate for long-term success. This includes temperature, humidity, and airflow. To maintain a stable climate of 40 to 80% humidity, 60 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and steady airflow, I suggest the following. Use a humidifier near your grow area to maintain humidity. Bags, clear plastic cups, and humidity domes work, but these options are a poor replacement for ambient humidity. Bags and plastic cups in particular can amplify the sun and roast plants with high sun exposure if grown on a windowsill. Use a space heater or air conditioner to keep your temperature between 65 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Going too far out of this temperature range can cause stress to the immune systems of the plants and lead to more fungal and pest infections. To measure your grow area's climate, I highly recommend purchasing a thermometer or humidity gauge like this one. There's a link in the description to buy one from Amazon. The next important point to cultivating carnivorous plants is lighting. The sun is the best light you can have for your plants. Since most homes do not have windowsills that provide enough light, Indoor growers are left to using indoor LED grow lights. Here you can see that I use an array of different fixtures. No matter what kind of lights you use, make sure to drape the cords before going to your outlet to prevent water-related electrical fires. An appropriately rated timer for your lights is critical to the long-term health of your plants. As a quick overview, lighting sources should be 4-6 to six inches away from most species of carnivorous plants. I recommend Yescom 225 lights as they cost around $30 off Amazon and work great for smaller collections. You can use 4-foot LED shop lights from most big box stores as well. I have a link in the description to the red-blue suncoat lights that I use for some of my racks. Make sure that you provide at least 12 hours of direct light to your plants a day. Going under this amount can stress certain tropical plants. Like climate shifts, this can lead to decreased immune function. Even plants like to sleep and some like Biblis only digest prey at night. As a safety tip, make sure you drape your cords and have a low spot to prevent water-related electrical fires. If you are growing your plants outside or on a window, use the species-specific lighting preference later in this video as a guide to how much exposure the plant should receive. For more sensitive carnivorous plants, and particularly highland plants, I'll use a mix of long fiber sphagnum moss. You can buy bales of this off Amazon for relatively cheap or find it at a local hardware store or nursery. I will sometimes mix this with perlite to allow for a little bit more drainage. Next up, water. First thing you need is a TDS meter like this. It'll measure the total dissolved solids in your water. You need water with under 100 parts per million of total dissolved solids for carnivorous plants. Here you can see my tap water comes in at around 100 parts per million. Next my reverse osmosis filtered water clocks in at 12 parts per million. To water I use the tray method, watering from the bottom of the pot. I fill these trays 1 to 2 inches up the pot and refill the trays once the tray is dry, but before the medium dries. For a quick overview, make sure to have a TDS meter and only use water under 100 parts per million of total dissolved solids. Tap water is usually unusable, so make sure to test it before use. Distilled water from a grocery store, pharmacy, or other store will work. Nursery water will also work. Water from an air conditioner or dehumidifier can be used, but is not recommended for the long term. Use the tray method of watering. Make sure the water is at least one inch from the bottom of the pot. If the soil dries, the plant dies. Top water all plants except pingwicula and some small rosetta drosera every two months to prevent mineral buildup, promote oxygen exchange, and prevent most fungal growth. 
Lastly, to fertilize or feed carnivorous plants, I use Maxi 161616 fertilizer and apply it as a foliar feed. You can mix a small amount with water and use an eyedropper or pipette, but I prefer to use a mixing bottle. I'll take small amounts on a plant tag and shake vigorously to mix. To be accurate, the mixture clocks in around 100 parts per million. I mist the plant's foliage thoroughly for about 30 minutes before lights go off every two weeks. Make sure to spray at an angle perpendicular to the pot to prevent excess fertilizer. This can cause algae growth that can be easily scraped away. Utricularia can be fed by spraying the topsoil, but back off if you see algae mats forming. Darlingtonia californica, or the cobra lily, is a pitcher plant native to Northern California and Oregon. It is native to mountain streams that particularly have serpentine running through them, which that coupled with their tongue, like appendage on the other side of the pitcher, are how they get the name cobra lily. Because of this, they like having very, very cold roots, and they experience a rather consistent temperature drop every night as the... Uh, nice fresh mountain air is sure to bring a nice cold breeze every day because of that you have to try to replicate this by giving them cold water as frequently as you can to the roots and try to give them a very cool environment overall now i personally have always had success with them inside and what gets funny to me is that I'll grow them, and without fail, it's the cycle I go through. Every four to five years, I'll buy some seeds, grow them. They always sprout pretty quick for me, about, you know, three, four months after I stratify. And without fail, I'll get a nice, beautiful, large plant with, like, nice big pitchers forming. Go to try to put it outside, and it dies. And it's always because they're getting too big to be inside. So I don't think cobra lilies need to be grown with dormancy as much as people think they need to be. The ones that I've grown have always succeeded so well that I would have to have put them outside. Because cobra lilies, unlike Saracenia or Heliamphora, do not conform to what you want in terms of a pot and like stay stunted and whatnot no instead cobra lilies love to grow in the smallest pot physically possible and then get as big as physically possible while in that pot even to the point like they'll even start tilting like tipping their pot over if you and it's kind of comical like it literally looks like one of those uh clowns riding a really tiny like you know uh tricycle or, or car or something like that you know it's just hilarious now keeping that in mind yeah, I find it very easy from the indoor perspective to keep cobra lilies because it's very easy to keep your conditions and climate very, you know, stable. And then if you, like me, whenever the lights go off at night, I generally do get a 5 to 10 degree drop very reliably. And my cobra lilies really respond positively to that. I also have noted that cobra lilies really like blue light as opposed to any red-blue lights. So do not do blurple, go for blue if you're growing cobras inside. Thank you for watching this far. I have links in the description to other great reference videos done by other nursery owners for the International Carnivorous Plant Society. These include a pesticide discussion from Damon of California Carnivores and a lighting presentation from Drew of Carnivoro. There's also a link to Barry Rice's Carnivorous Plant FAQ, which has been invaluable to my own learning. Once again, if you want to try growing carnivorous plants or expand your collection, check out my website. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel for more carnivorous plant content. I wish you happy growing and great success. Thanks again.